Hello Church. The focus of the last few weeks has been on the passages from Exodus 34, 6-7, said to be the most quoted verses in the Bible by the Bible. You've heard so far from Ruth, uh, Vicky and Graham, uh, and they looked at different aspects of these verses, and now it's my turn. It's been such a long time since I uh, last read Exodus, so I thought I'd reread it and get the context for these verses, and it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I was going to go through that with you uh, until I stumbled upon a couple of videos that do it so much better than I could, uh, has some fantastic imagery along with the explanation. It takes about 10 minutes, so sit back and enjoy the efforts of the Bible Project team. Uh, it does skip over a lot of the detail, so I do recommend that you read Exodus um, yourselves, just to get a sense of what an amazing time in history it was. Especially, um, I found the, the Moses God Israel Israelite relationship developing. And not so much the tent planning and tent building bits, but that's not for me. Anyway, here we go. Let's talk about the book of Exodus. Now, you're probably familiar with this book because of the epic story of Moses leading Israel out of slavery from Egypt. Yeah, but that's just the first half of the book. The second half has Moses giving the Ten Commandments to Israel along with these blueprints for making a sacred tent. Now right here in the middle is the story that connects these two halves together and it all takes place at the foot of a famous mountain. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. So the first thing we have to remember is we're continuing the story from Genesis. Yeah, in Genesis, God promised Abraham that through his family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Genesis ends with Abraham's family down in Egypt. When Exodus begins, 400 years have passed, the family grows and becomes the people group now called Israel. But there's this huge problem because the Israelites are enslaved to this king of the Egyptians, a guy called Pharaoh. This guy is really bad news. Yeah, he's horrible. He, he disregards their humanity, he brutally enslaves them, and he even orders that all of the Israelites' sons should be killed by throwing them into the Nile River. He wants to wipe these people out the worst character in the Bible so far. Here's where we meet an Israelite woman who wants to save her son. And so she does throw him in the river, but safely in this little reed basket. And Pharaoh's daughter finds this baby and takes him as her own. And this is the boy who grows up to become Moses, the man who will rescue Israel from slavery. So Moses grows up, and one day, much later in his life, he has this crazy encounter with God where he comes across a bush that's on fire, but it isn't actually burning up. And God speaks from the bush, and he appoints Moses as the man he will use to deliver Israel. So Moses goes to Pharaoh to tell him this, this news that God wants his people free. And Pharaoh, he just pretty much laughs at him. <laughs> He's like, Who, who's this God, Yahweh? And in fact, he's so offended by this request, he decides to make the Israelites work even harder. So discouraged, Moses goes back to God and says, listen, this plan's not going to work. But God repeats his promise that he's going to rescue them. And in fact, it's right here for the first time in the Bible that we hear the word redemption. It literally just means to purchase a slave's freedom. But God here uses this word to describe what he's going to do for enslaved Israel. And God knows Pharaoh is going to resist, so he sends 10 different plagues, one after another, like turning water into blood, sending all sorts of pests and disease. These plagues are really severe. They are severe, but we need to understand that the story is presenting these as acts of divine justice against one of the worst oppressors in the story of the Bible. And they're all aimed at the purpose of rescuing these enslaved people and defeating the gods of Egypt. This all comes to a climax at the 10th plague, where God's going to kill the firstborn sons across all Egypt. Every house, it's pretty rough. It is, but it's also God's response for how Pharaoh killed the Israelite sons. Now as you turn the page, you suddenly get two long chapters of detailed instructions for what's essentially throwing a 
dinner party with a recipe for a lamb. Yeah, but this lamb is super important. God tells the Israelites to pick it out and to prepare it to be eaten. And they're supposed to take its blood and then paint it all over the doorframe of their house. And anyone who is in that house will be spared from this final plague. And so this meal, which is called Passover, it commemorates this key moment in the story where God brings his justice on human evil, but also shows mercy by providing this substitute. This final plague makes Pharaoh angry and he demands that Israel gets out of Egypt, which is great. But suddenly as they leave, Pharaoh changes his mind. He has a change of heart. But on top of that, we're also told that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Why would God do that? Well, what we need to remember is that over and over in this story, Pharaoh has already chosen to harden his own heart. And so at this point, Pharaoh, he's not just evil, he's become monstrously evil. Even his own advisors think that he has gone way too far. And so how is God supposed to deal with such an extreme form of evil? And what we see in this story is that God uses his power to lure evil into its own destruction. Pharaoh and his army are destroyed in the Red Sea as Israel passes into freedom. And after this, we find the very first song of worship in the Bible as the people praise God for redeeming them. And it's in this story that the word salvation is also used for the first time, which means simply to be rescued from danger. Now that they're saved, you would think that everything should be great but the story quickly turns. The Israelites start wandering in the desert. They're tired, hungry, lost. And you start to wonder, what's God doing? What were they saved for? The book has a second half where Moses gives the Ten Commandments to Israel along with these instructions about building a sacred tent. And what links these two halves together is this crucial story. The people of Israel, they're out in the middle of nowhere. They find themselves at the foot of this mountain called Sinai. And here, God's presence comes dramatically down in the form of a violent storm cloud. Now let's stop a second and talk about this concept of God's presence because it's really important for the rest of the book. At the beginning of the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, humanity was in God's presence They had this close relationship with him and it was good. But humanity rebels and the relationship is fractured and access to God's presence is lost. But God promised Abraham that he would restore his blessing to all of the nations. And that includes this restoration of relationship and access to God's presence. So here at Sinai, God's presence is now right here in front of them. And it's actually quite frightening. And he's here to invite Israel into this unique and close relationship with him. And the word used to describe this relationship is covenant. It's like a legal agreement between God and Israel. And it's unique because up till now, God hasn't asked Israel to do anything in return, just to trust him. But here on this mountain, God is going to ask Israel to do something. A lot of things, actually. He gives them a whole set of laws. that It includes the Ten Commandments. And if they obey these commandments, they will become the people who will represent God to the nations of the world. Like a priest would. Yeah, in fact, that's what God calls them to become, a kingdom of priests. And this is all connected back to the promise to Abraham that his family would become a blessing to the nations. Okay, but obeying these laws is going to be difficult because... There's a lot of them, and they set a really high standard. Though if you think about it, I mean, of anybody in the world who should be able to do it, I mean, it's these people who experienced firsthand God's grace and his power when he rescued them from slavery. And and they agree to obey the terms, but then they refuse to go into God's presence because it's, well, it's still a bit frightening. And since the people won't go up, Moses goes up to the mountain by himself to meet with God. But God still wants to be with all of his people. And so he says, okay, if the people won't come up here to me, I'll come down off this mountain to be with you all. And that's why he orders Moses to build this elaborate tent as a place where God's presence can be among his people. And that's why the next thing we get is seven chapters of extremely detailed architectural blueprints for this tent. It's really, really really long. But every detail is important and has some kind of symbolic value. For example, there's all this Garden of Eden imagery inside the tent. And it's to remind you that when you're in the tent, you are in God's presence. Then we get another six chapters describing how they built the tent, which is really just repeating the same blueprints word for word. Now let's back up because before the tent is finished, there's this super important story. Moses is coming off the mountain with the Ten Commandments and the blueprints in his hands, and he finds Israel breaking the first two commands of the covenant. Don't have any other gods before me and 
don't worship idol statues. Right, and so here we are, immediately after agreeing to the covenant, they're throwing this ritual party, they're worshiping an idol. And so God says to Moses, you know what, this is, this is not going to work. I should just wipe these people out and start over with you. But Moses reminds God of his promise to Abraham and pleads with God to spare them, which is a really weird conversation. Why would God need to be reminded of something. Yeah, it does seem odd, but this dialogue is inviting us into God's experience of grief and pain due to Israel's actions, and he really could walk away. But instead, this God chooses faithfulness to his own promises even though he knows it's going to cost him. So we come to the end of the book. The tabernacle's built, God's presence comes down off the mountain to fill it, and in the final scene, Moses goes to enter the tabernacle to be in God's presence. But he can't. He's actually not able to go inside, and that's how the book ends. Why can't he go in? That was the whole point. So when Israel worshipped the golden calf, it was like a slap in the face to God's faithfulness. And so Moses can't just waltz into the tent like everything's just fine. There's a deeper problem still in this relationship. Will they ever be able to fix the relationship and go into God's presence? Well, that's what the next book, Leviticus, is all about. Those videos really helped summarize the main points of Exodus. And I really like the thought of God desperate to be close to his people, uh, but also having to show at the same time his justice is also real too. For our Exodus, we see the relationship between God and Moses develop, um, both wanting to be closer and, and having many conversations. In the first encounters with God, Moses starts off by pleading that he's just not a good enough communicator and he needs his brother's help uh, to talk to the Pharaoh. Uh, but we see that he grows in confidence to the extent that he can even question God and even change the course of God's actions, actually persuading God to go against what he said. And we saw how God was angry at the people's slide back into idol worship and he threatened to destroy them. Um, until Moses got to the point where he was much braver and articulate than he thought he could ever be, saved them by changing God's mind. Having said that, in spite of God's promises, his protection and his provision, it does feel like it's a, it's a hazardous, tread carefully type of relationship, with the many instructions and laws and the consequential punishments. It seems like a, a relationship where obedience is compulsory with dire consequences if anyone steps out of line. So for Moses and the Israelites, I think it's reasonable to assume how they could be living in fear of tripping up at the next temptation. Up to this point, it would be entirely understandable to view God as mostly an authoritarian God, that ensuring care for his people but with the proviso that his many laws and instructions need to be followed if you don't want to get punished. Over the course of the book, there's also an unveiling of more of God's characteristics. Um, and in the middle of all this, we get a further revelation that's, that's really easy to miss. So God talks of his love for his people for the first time. Uh, more precisely, it's typically translated as love, as we'll see. Um, and we see it three times in Exodus. Firstly, within the uh, text uh, where the commandments are given, in Exodus 26, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And then in the verse we are focusing on today, Exodus 34, 6, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And again, immediately after in Exodus 34, 7, as if to prove the point, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. So God declares his love for his people and it's a committed love, a covenant love, like a marriage where promises are made and expectations are mutually held with consequences for broken promises. It's a love that desires closeness, has depth, enjoys conversation, has respect, faithfulness, trust and obedience at its core. 
So today I am focusing on the abounding in love and faithfulness part of verse 7. To delve a bit deeper, we'll look at how the Hebrew has been translated. Uh, the Hebrew words used in the verses are hesed and emet, and aren't easily translated. So we have uh, abounding in love and faithfulness, abundant in goodness and truth, abundant in kindness and truth, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love. There isn't a straightforward literal translation. Emet seems to be easier of the two. It means truth. Chesed is trickier. Plus the words can be thought of as compounded, uh, like peanut butter instead of peanut and butter. And the Bible uses chesed a lot, 246 times in the Old Testament apparently. And it can be translated as love, loyalty, devotion, steadfast love, mercy, grace, righteousness, glory and hope. And the majority of the time it's used when describing God. However, before it's used by God in Exodus verses, it's used purely in human contexts involving interpersonal relationships between individuals and groups, either in families or, and friends or between kings and their subjects. Uh, its uses suggest practical action on behalf of another and is enduring to, relating to the agreements and commitments built into relationships. Plus there's the word rap in there too, meaning abounding. And so um, I tried translating this verse and, and came up with a boundless, relentless, loyal love. And this type of love means faithfulness to the end, no matter what the cost. But there's a catch, if you can call it that. All this love stuff from God doesn't come for free. There's a bigger, eternal plan behind all of this. To be chosen is to be loved, which is to be blessed, but also means to be a blessing. The deal is to pass it on. In Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and I will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So I can get hung up on the be blessed bit, and not so much on being a blessing. However, there's this strange inbuilt feature of humans, maybe not all of them, but it does actually feel good to be a blessing to someone, anyone. You don't even need to know them. In fact, I think it feels even better the less you know them, like foreigners and strangers. So, how do we be a blessing? Firstly, we need to be in line with what God has shown to be on his heart. In Exodus 23, he lays out laws on justice and mercy. Don't gossip, be honest, ignore peer pressure, don't show favouritism, help people, help those in need, protect the innocent, don't take bribes. I read this as a description of how to be a person who stands out as having uh, unshakable integrity so that no one can slander you uh, or accuse, uh, be accused of wrongdoings. In essence, tell the truth regardless, be honourable, be helpful. And lastly, don't forget about the foreigners or strangers. God knew the fallibility of the Israelites and how they would stray from these laws in the future. Also in Exodus 22, God tells us how he will be angry, angered by the cries of the destitute to the point where those responsible will be punished. And we'll hear later from two of the prophets uh, that spoke to the Israelites when they lost their way in the, in the way they treated others. Um, fast forward to the beginnings of Jesus' ministry in Luke 14. Straight after 40 days, tempted in the desert, he went to the temple was handed the scroll of Isaiah and read this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And then he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So how to bless people with literal metaphorical examples. I'm definitely loved by God. 
I'm definitely blessed by his love. So the question I'm asking myself from all of this is, am I a blessing to others? The answer is, not sure. Maybe, but if so, probably not enough. I think we should be asking ourselves the blessing question, not just as individuals, but also as a church, locally, nationally, and globally. It's worth checking in on ourselves that we haven't fallen into the same traps the Israelites did, who are essentially the same as us, but without the tech. Have we fallen into rituals and habits that may seem like a good idea, but are not the best use of our time and resources? This links to the first prophet I referred to earlier, Amos 5, 21 to 24. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want, that's all I want. And if I wasn't sure how to be a blessing, I could do a lot worse than follow these words. And it's obvious that we are surrounded by injustice and unfairness in a multitude of ways. Let me overload you with a small list. 12 million displaced Syrians, Rohingya refugees, persecution of people groups globally, mass incarceration, death penalties, racism and white privilege, gender inequalities, access to clean water, access to education, people trapped in the drugs trade, people smuggling, sex trafficking, slavery, persecution based on gender, identity and sexuality, pollution, global warming, arms trade, homelessness, poverty, loneliness, and of course, I've missed out many, many more. In fact, we have oceans of injustice and unfairness. But how powerful is this? Forget all that worthless stuff. What does God want? He wants justice, oceans of it. He wants fairness, rivers of it. That's all he wants. That's all he wants. These are the kind of laws I want to obey and be faithful to. So how about we put our prayers and creativity into being those standout people that God desired from the beginning, who listen and obey and strive for justice and fairness in all its forms, knowing full well that it's unlikely there will be quick fixes, plenty of knockbacks, and that if we're serious, we're going to have to be in it for the long haul. I'm in. Finally, to finish, the second prophet, with a few simple words worth remembering that have an awesome power to change lives. Micah 6 eight. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you.